OK, hi, everyone. Welcome to lecture six of AI 605. So today we'll be talking about text generation, encoder, decoder, and decoder attention. So um, first announcements. And I'll be doing a few recaps from our last lecture. And then we'll be going into the materials that we want to cover today. So I believe all of you have seen the announcements for the assignment one. So it's out, it's available on the class website since last Wednesday. And it's due next Wednesday, 11 p.m. I believe. So please start working on it early. Use GitHub discussions for Q and A's if you want to ask questions. So I think there are a lot of bonus questions. Um, so what happens with the bonus questions if you get over 100? It will be counting towards other assignments too. So if you have, for instance, 120 points for this assignment, and then you have like 80 points for assignment two, then the surplus 20 points will be used for assignment two's um, the deducted 20 points. So probably it's a good idea to work on the bonus questions if you can, so that you can have a less pressure on later assignments. Assignment two will be out right after one is due and will be due in another two weeks. So it will be April 14th. This can vary depending on some situations, but uh, we're planning to release the assignment by then. And this will be about token classification with attention specifically for machine reading comprehension. So once you have done this assignment, you'll be able to demo your model to answer questions where the answers can be found in documents, you know, like Wikipedia. And probably you already noticed this, but I added some references on the course webpage, especially the other classes in other institutions. For instance, I think Stanford's CS 20, 224 and is one of the most popular classes I think many people have taken maybe in this class, although um, our um, our um, syllabus is not exactly following that. It's a bit different, So, but still it would be very, help, very helpful if you actually go over that too. Um, and other institutions are also in the um, references too. I think Berkeley is there, UW, and also, and one thing I wanted to also mention is that the there is also a textbook. I think some students asked me via email whether there is any more textbook-like materials. And I recommend speech and language processing. This is actually available for free. It's by Jeffsky and Martin. And it can be helpful for those, of course, who like to study through these textbooks, whether than things like uh, you know, you, uh, this video lecture or more of, um, I would say, rather not so textbook-like materials. So please check it out. Please um, take a look at those these materials and they can be very helpful for your learning. And I think another thing I wanted to mention is probably doing the assignment itself will be very helpful for you to learn because um, the assignment not only includes the problems, but also ex includes some explanations about concepts. So keep that in mind too. Okay, so recap. So I forgot to put recap here. So I think in last lecture, we mentioned that, I mentioned that what we're, what we're gonna cover for the entire class this semester will can be explained with these um, these um these boxes. So we have so far covered a few tasks, including sentiment classification and machine reading. So these are the tasks that we want to accomplish with some machine learning models. It's like our objectives. And in order to create a model for these tasks, you create you formulate this into some 
abstract problems like text classification, token classification, or it can be text generation. And probably I can also add one more thing here. Although um, this is also type of, um, I would say quite similar to text classification is uh, retrieval. It's very similar to text classification or token classification, but we can go into details later for now. For now, think of it as uh, three formulations. And we covered RNNs. Apparently your assignment number one is about RNNs. In fact, um, your assignment one number one will be about RNNs and text classification. Your assignment number two will be token classification using RNNs and attention. So it's something like this. And your assignment th uh, four will be about text generation. Wait, was it four or three? Uh, I think it's four, yeah. Four, four will be about text generation with encoder decoder transformer. And this will be using um, hugging face pre-trained models, whereas assignment one and two will be using vanilla. So I think you get the point how the assignments are structured. It's intended for you to cover all the core concepts. Assignment one was about actually sentiment classification. Two is about machine reading. Um, four will be either about machine translation or summarization. There quite similar in terms of how you formulate it though. The difference is that in summarization, usually you're operating within the same language. We'll go into that a bit more in this class, in this lecture. Okay, so that's good. Yep, so today, after today's lecture, you'll be covering most of these uh, most of the task formulation model. And the objective is that probably we're gonna spend one or two more lectures on transformer and other things in the model. And that will conclude all the models that we have done up to, um, I mean, all the things up to vanilla learning. And after that, we'll be moving to other paradigms of learning, which is more recent, such as pre-training, fine-tuning, and last year, super recent is in, in context learning. We'll be covering very, very, very briefly about it because it's really recent one. So it, it's it's more of a, I think we need to, we cannot really cover this a lot in the introductory NLP class. So recap. So token classification mentioned that this is also known as sequence tagging. And in text classification, the difference is that you classify the entire text into categories. So for instance, sentiment classification is one, uh, such a kind, but in token classification, you classify each token of the text. So we mentioned that this is quite different and there are reasons when we need this. So in token classification, as opposed to text classification, you have an input, right? Um, you have a, inputs and this goes into RNNs. And then you have some outputs here. The point of text classification was that whether you use the last hidden state or you, you average the every uh, hidden state from every time step, you obtain one vector to classify the entire text into some categories. But in token classification, you classify at the token level. So you classify each hidden state into something. So usually that goes through some, some um, weights to obtain logits for different categories per token. This is quite different from text classification 
which oftentimes uses the last hidden state, or you can average it. In the assignment, I was, I'm asking you to do actually average H one, two, three. So I can probably show you that here. So you have H one, two, and three, and you have some average pooling method. This is just simple averaging method to obtain H average. And this goes into some weight to have different categories to class in, classify into for the entire text. So you see the clear difference between token classification and text classification. And their purposes are different too, right? So we mentioned that too. So token classification can be useful for, for instance, part of speech tagging because we have to in, uh, explicitly tag each word into one of these categories. And I mentioned that POS tagging, it's often called POS tagging, is quite um, also could be, it's a machine learning problem, not just a matching problem because each word can have different role or different part of speech depending on its context. So for instance, the word first can be, um, they have, they can, can have two roles, right? And I think I mentioned about hand, right? Hand can be either verb, where it means that you hand in something, you hand in your assignment. It can be a noun, of course, because it refers to your hand. So the, this will entirely depend on the context. You cannot figure this out just looking at the word. That's why this can be a machine learning problem. Although POS tagging is it, relatively an easy problem, which means the accuracy is like 99%, I think right now with uh, very simple machine learning engines. Also mentioned about named entity recognition. So this was a bit more tricky than the part of speech tagging because it was not just about each word, but you also have to specify the span of each person, organization or location. And that's why we introduced bio tagging or IOB tagging, where you give B for the first word of the, the target entity an I for the non-first word of target entity and O for other things that you will not classify into person, organization, location. So for instance, Sparag, we want to label this as B of person. Obama will be I of person. And was is O, the is O, present is probably O, O, O. United will be B of location and states will be I of location. And the period will be probably O if we actually include that in our tagging targets. And I also mentioned that MRC can be also considered as token classification problem because here the input is text and question and probably one of the straight, most straightforward way to consider this is just concatenate them. And then, then the input is a text and question concatenated into one sequence and your expected output will be a span. So you can think of it as another biotagging problem too, right? But difference is that because you will have only one span per sequence, input sequence, we don't really need um, I instead of I, we can just have a B and E. So B is a beginning or start. So we can have just start position of the answer phrase and end position of the answer phrase and other things will be all others. It, it, it is also actually possible to frame this as just BIO too, right? In that case, then um, the answer will be just, for instance, if this, um, if a word like that in, in, like that in the document, and if we want to consider this as the answer, if we use the, the, the same biotagging way, then this can be B, I, I, and other things are O. But the point was that because we can, we, we can only have one possible answer, why not just formulate this problem as um, O, S, O, E, O. You get the point, hopefully, what the difference is. But whatever they, you do, 
uh, if you do it correctly, then you know that the answer will be exactly the same. But we'll see soon, probably next lecture, why the if we consider these two methods, number one and number two, why this is better. In the next lecture. Okay, so and um, how can we design a model for MRC? One of the most straightforward way will be quite similar to how you would model text classification. So you can put your documents here. Your for let's say you just put the question here. So you have a question one, question two. These are the question words, and then you put some special token, for instance, and then you put your document words then you put on simple rnn and suppose that the answer is d1 d2 then what you want to what your what your what you want your model to output is something like this has to be some vector and you classify this into several set three classes b s and an s s e and o for instance then you want d1 to be s so this has to be high and your d2 has to be end so this has to be high and other things oh Other things will be all O. So same formulation, right? It's if you can create this model, then you can expect that your model will be able to answer questions, hopefully. But we mentioned that this is usually not good enough because once you get to document side, the LSTM, even if you're using LSTM, not vanilla RNN, you will forget a lot of information that has, has to be conveyed from the question side. So just using vanilla LSTM is no more good enough to convey the information far enough. And that's where the, um, the concept of attention mechanism comes in. And this was actually originally proposed in machine translation we discussed, right? So I wanna talk about how this was developed in the Machine, machine translation community. And later after how we see why that was so useful or how, how that actually impacted the machine translation community back then in 2014, 2015, actually this is 2015. Um, then we'll come, come back to the, um, the, our question answering or machine reading comprehension task. So, for the rest of the today's lecture, I'll be talking about these two and these, these um, three, four concepts. Of course, these are all vanilla training, by the way. So why do we need to do text generation? Really one obvious application is summarization. So here you're given a long text of a news article and you want to summarize that into a few sentences, one or two sentences here. This article is being summarized into, this is the input and this is the output. So of course, in this case, the, the, um, the reporter already wrote down the the desired output of the input, right? So that's why this kind of data can be very good training data that people have used. In fact, in recent machine learning communities have used these news article data for summarization because it's already there. You can just obtain them from the from the news media websites, right? So that's very convenient. And
are they useful? Because this story highlights might not be there, right? Or you're, you're reading some new article that doesn't have the summarization and you don't want to spend your time reading the entire article, then maybe summarization can be very helpful, right? So that's the uh, really the purpose of summarization but you need to note that there are actually two types of summarizations. One is it's called extractive and extractive summarization is a simplification of the problem by enforcing your summary to be only made up of words, phrases, or sentences from the original. So hence the problem can be approached as a text or token classification problem. Do you see this, why this is the case? Because then essentially what you're trying to do is you're given a sequence, right? And then in the extractive case, you're given sequence. And because your summary has to be only made up of words for a sentence from your original and one more thing is you're usually assuming that the order is not shuffled, which means you just have to classify whether each word in the original sentence is contained or not in the final summary. So this becomes basically token level classification problem, right? So it's basically either contained or not, contained or not. You just classify each token into these. And then you just take for instance, contained ones to make the final summary. And if your summary is always um, sentence level wise, not altered or changed, then you can make this into text classification problem, right? You look into each sentence and you classify whether each sentence belongs to final summary. In fact, this is like actually one of the most effective way to do summarization at the moment, even now, because most of the times news articles, their first sentences are the most important sentences. And sometimes there are also important sentences in the middle of the news articles, but very rarely you have to break down the sentence into shorter ones. Not only is it difficult, but some many, many cases it's not necessary. So why not just make that into a sentence classification problem? You are given a document, you, your document will be consisted of many sentences, and then you classify each sentence, each sentence into contained or not, and you only consider contained ones. So that's very convenient, right? But apparently, a lot of summary, really good summaries are paraphrases, not exact, I would say extraction from the original news article or document. And in this case, you cannot make any assumption about whether your summary will be entirely of extractive, I mean, extracted, extracted from the original article, nor you cannot also assume that the words will not be shuffled. Maybe you're talking about something before other things where the other things were appearing first in the original article. So that's why in the abstractive case, you have to approach this problem as text generation problem. And this is quite obvious in machine translation because in machine translation, there is no way, unless you're translating into very similar or the same language, that you will have same words in the input and output sources, right? Input and output sequences. So that motivates why we need text generation. And it's often called sequence generation too. So don't be confused, please, because they're the same thing. And here, the problem can be formulated as your input is an arbitrary length text. And this is actually same as text and token classification. But the core difference is that your output is also an arbitrary length text. And this means that the, this formulation has very high degree of freedom. Why? Because you can actually turn any problem into text generation because 
even the text or token classification, your output can be considered as text instead of some specific class. So for instance, what I mean is, suppose that we want to do sentiment classification. You remember that sentiment classification was more about your given text. And you have some like, for instance, pooling method to get the final H. And then this goes into some W to have two classes, right? Positive and negative. That's great, but what you can, can we can also do is your input is this, and you just map this to, to some text that's surface form is positive or negative. So you are you can ask the model to generate either the word positive or negative, not as a class, but as a text output. I hope you get the difference. Please ask me if you do not. So what I want to say is that the same thing holds for token classification because the output of the token can be also sequentially flattened to be considered as a class, as a text output. So you can turn any problem, actually, any problem that takes text as an input into text generation problem, if you like. So most language problems can be formulated this way. That's why this problem formulation is so powerful. But why people don't do that? I mean, I mean, when they can, because giving a large degree of freedom to the model is usually not a good idea in many ways. Um, one, one reason is that you, you usually make the model heavier. It becomes more inefficient. So you want to actually give some basically inductive bias into how you formulate the problem too so that you can make your problem very efficient and also very accurate in many cases if your data is limited. But then of course, um, in many problems, text generation approach is the only approach to resolve the problem such as abstractive summarization or machine translation that we just discussed. And while this is very powerful formulation because you can formulate any problem into this kind of formulation. The problem was that the community, the machine learning and natural language processing community had very little idea how we can do this until very recently, which is like about 2014, 2015. But things actually changed since then. So what has changed? So in 2014, so let's, let me give a really brief, I'll say, history or um, overview of what was happening in, in 2014. So personally, I was actually um, a second year PhD student. And I remember that when I was um, entering the grad school, uh, there were very few, or I haven't even heard of deep learning when I was actually first year. And in NLP, people were using SVMs, um, linear regressions with feature engineering to do various tasks. There was some notion of a deep learning that we, he we heard that, oh, it's working quite well in vision, but we're thinking, oh, that's not gonna work in NLP. And people were like just working on very traditional methods back then. And then in 2014, um, in from the University of Montreal, um, so this, Folks, um, so actually, for instance, uh, Cho is now in NYU. Um, they actually came up with um, a, basically a way to create a text generation model. And that was using the RNNs that we learned already in our class. How can we generate a text, not just classify or classify text or token, but can we? how can we generate new text with the um, RN-like architecture. And the idea was actually, if you, after you read it, it's like kind of aha moments that, oh, that actually makes sense. And I think these kind of uh, advancements are really the ones that really changed the world. But if you actually hear about it, it's quite 
in some in some sense like it's quite obvious like what why could, people could have couldn't have thought about it before then but of course um it's a really i think all ma many advancements many uh discoveries are like this when, once you hear about it it's very obvious that it would work it looks like it's gonna work so what people what uh what they did back back then in 2014 is that they use rnn to um they basically it's the same thing. You saw this, right? It's very similar to what we saw in the um, LSTM RNNs. You use RNNs to go sequentially through all the tokens in the input. But the really interesting thing here is that you basically summarize the, the entire sentence's meaning into one vector, which is C. And this is um, in the original paper was the last hidden state of the RNN. And you have other RNN, which is a bit different from the encoder in the, in the sense that now this doesn't have basically um, input like encoder. Its input will be the output from the previous time step. So what that means is that this is an RNN, but this Y1, of course, is first token so this doesn't have some meaningful initialize and this just have random some initialization of course here it can be considered as actually wait start token people will usually call and start token goes into the input of the decoder rnn and it outputs the first word as a vector you can turn a vector into word by having uh, some linear mapping into the vocab, right? Then you use the output from the previous time step as the input for the next time step. So actually this arrow is referring to that. It's not super clear from the di diagram, but you can think of it as uh, Y1's going into the RNN as an input and Y2 goes an output here. And then you do the same thing until you output what's called stop token. So you're using RNN as an encoder in the input side, but you're using RNN or LSTM as a decoder at the output side. That's a bit different usage from how the RNN is used in the encoder side. And this concept was basically just mind blowing back then because what that means is that if this works at least theoretically then you can practically generate anything you want this output can be anything it doesn't have to be class a certain class as long as you have the vocab available in your model you can create anything with this decoder and of course vanilla rnn as we saw it doesn't work well so we, you, they could have used LSTM, but they instead proposed GRU, which is gated recurrence unit, which is basically, which basically has very similar functionalities as LSTM, but it's simpler. So that's the advantage of uh, GRU. So let's go into a bit more details and actually it's surprisingly simple so there are not that many details so i told you that going through the rnn on the encoder side just give c this is quite simple so we only have to look at the decoder side or new things in this architecture and as you see f is the rnn model this you can think of as lstm for now or just vanilla rnn it doesn't matter in fact it was GRU though and you see that you see a, familiar, a very familiar formulation that you have your input as your input is for the previous hidden state. And this is the, uh, the input, which has to be actually, uh, this would have been XT if this was encoder side, but this is not encoder. So you don't have an input. You cannot use the input from the, um, the the, you cannot use the actual input as the input for this RNN. So what your input will be the, the previous time steps output, which is yt minus one. Previous output, 
But as I've told you, if, if t equal to one, then there is no such thing as previous output. So your y zero will be just a special token call start. And you have one more input to this decoder, which is this RNN, which is C, this is coming from the encoder side. And the point is that we're hoping that the, the meaning or the content of the entire sentence, input sentence is contained in this C so that the decoder can refer to that as it wants to, whenever it wants to. And once you have obtained these decoder hidden states, then you use the decoder hidden state and the um, basically, what is it? This is vector, right? And also the previous time steps uh, input and also the, the encoder, encoder uh, the, the encoded input sentence. We consider this as input and predict the, the current output. This is current output. So this completes one full step of decoding. So this, this has just created one word. And the next step will be that you put this newly created current output as the input to the next time steps RNN. So in that case, of course, it will be H T plus one will be F of H T. We have this, right? And Y T, we have this too just now because we have the power distribution. We just like, we can, we can just sample from this distribution to obtain the most likely word. And lastly, C is just fixed. So it's qu um, quite simple. Oh, so by the way, so here H is a vector and Y is actual word that comes out from the vocab. Okay. So hopefully that's straightforward for most of you. All right, but then um, I wanna mention that um, this was not sufficient for really do really good job on machine translation though. It was pretty good idea in that it's end to end model. You don't have to deal with any feature engineering. It's at least, theoret at least theoretically capable of doing a lot of different things without hassles, but there was one big issue. There was one big assumption that, oh, can you really, I will say, are you sure? Like that the C can fully represent the sentences meaning it's like a assumption that we had right i mean we can definitely encode the sentence meaning into this single vector but can you really do that i mean there was a um workshop in 2014 of course uh, um the this code is not specifically about this encoder decoder framework but um the point is that can you really contain the meaning of the entire sentence into uh with a single vector and that's usually very hard and it's even really, it's still hard these days. So maybe this assumption is not really achievable that containing the entire sentences information without any loss into a vector. So that what people call is bottleneck problem. And we will see um, after three minute break, how um, the recent work resolved this so that we can do better on machine translation, but we'll be having a very short break and um, we'll come back at 
Okay, let's get back to the class. All right, so, so as I've said, it is clear that the we are assuming this assumption C can fully represent, fully contain the sentence meaning, but there is no guarantee that it can. And in fact, that was, it still proves to be very difficult even if you increase the embedding size a lot. So the, so what really happened, uh, so the, in order to resolve this problem, people brought, research brought the concept of attention mechanism. So, so let's see again why, what, where the bottleneck problem comes up. So we're saying that the C here is just a vector. And when you're decoding, the only path that you can refer to the information from the input is this vector. And so this vector cannot lose any information in order for the decoder to work. This is exactly the bottleneck problem. And in order to resolve this, um, right after the this paper, so actually, it's actually by the same people. Um, now Cho went to the second author. Uh, Benji is still here. Badana was second author in the first paper, actually. Um, they proposed what's called attention mechanism. <clears throat> and to be more, to be more exact, um, this is really a decoder with attention. So it's a decoder attention, basically. The attention is on the decoder side. So what they did was, because if your bottleneck is basically trying to summarize the entire input sequence into a single vector, why don't we actually um, have a method to look at the tokens directly from the decoder side instead of having just one vector to look at. So this is the concept that you want to be able to, instead of summarizing the entire input into a single vector, we want to allow the decoder to directly access few relevant input tokens. But here the important concept is that the act of accessing, so the act of canonical memory access, is non-differentiable because what you're trying to do here is that you're basically computing argmax. And argmax is clearly non-differentiable. However, argmax can be approximated with soft attention mechanism. In fact, using softmax for differentiability. So we'll see that in the next slide. And another way of looking at this is that basically the attention is a dynamic summarization per decoding step. Okay, so what do I, what do I mean by that? So let's go over one by one carefully. So remember this detector C? So initially we had just single vector, right? Single vector. One C for the entire model, right? Previously. But now we will have different Cs, which is different summarization of the input vector per I. And what is I here? I is the time step at the decoding time not the encoding time, by the way. So let's get let's go over one by one. So we want to compute the summary, summary, summarization vector C of I at decoding time, time step I, which is defined as the weighted average of the encoder output, Hj. So J is here. I is decoding time. Um, and J is encoding time. And we want to give it a weight so that 
we want to compute more of a weighted average than just average. Why do, we, why do you want to do that? Because we don't want to just average it. Then in that case, then we'll have the same C for every decoding time step. But instead, we want to dynamically control what token we want to access, what encoder time step we want to access at each decoder time. So suppose that, let's say this alpha ij is a one hot vector. So basically let's say that for instance, alpha ij is one, actually, my bad. So let's say we have fixed i, and then let's say that uh, alpha i three is one, and alpha i of j equals zero for j not equal to one, or not three, I mean. So what does this mean? This means that ci will be just simply h of three, right? But in reality, this is the um, the exactly the argmax where you access just the third token in the input, which is not differentiable. So um, what we want to be able to do is that um, we want to be able to softly control where you look at. So in reality, what the alpha values will be more like will be something like 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and 0 0.8 where 0 0.8 is the dominant vector that you're getting the, um, the hj. And in order to compute the alpha, you basically compute the similarity between or the relevance between, it's the third equation here, you compute the relevance between each input token, hidden state, we know how to get this. And the decoder's hidden state, which is SI minus one. The previous decoder hidden state. So this is prev decoder hidden state. And this is um, each encoder hidden state. So we want to, we want this similar similarity or relevance this relevance score to be very high. If you think, if the model thinks that the, at the current time step, it wants to focus on this um, HJ or the token at time step J of encoder. And of course we want the value to be low otherwise. And note that this is not it's unsigned. This is sign number. So this can be um, very negative or very positive. And do you remember what we did in order to create a probability distribution from these such unbounded values? We use softmax, right? That's why we use softmax. And I hope you remember this. You remember that this was actually used for classification to compute the logits for classification at the end. You do the same thing here. And this, soft, this softmax enables you to always focus on one or very few things because you can never go above 1.0. Your summation can, has to be always 1.0, which means what you focus on or what your average vector will, your average vector depends on will be only few encoder hidden states. So hopefully you get this. So now then the question is, how do you compute relevance? And in, in the neural, in, in neural nets or in general deep learning, the point is that you always want to compute some relevance or some scores that depends on the relevant vectors with differentiability maintained. So this is just one way of doing it. And actually I want you to remember this similarity or uh, have a close look at the similarity function because when we're going coming back to attention when we're covering transformer, which is basically the um, the mostly most most used architecture in the model NLP, you will see what's the, really the core difference between why why the transformer was so different from, for instance, uh, these 
mechanisms of computing the similarity for the attention mechanism. But for now, let's look into how this works. Okay, so as you see, recap, you're computing the relevance between the each, each encoder token, hidden state for each, each encoder token. And this is the previous hidden state of the decoder. And the similarity between these two, so what basically it's deciding, okay, you're given the previous hidden state of decoder. What do you want to focus on for the current time step decoder given these hidden states of the encoder? And how you compute that is you have some vector to learn. This is a parameter. This is a parameter to learn. And this is also parameter to learn. This is also parameter to learn. But you have a, a way of uh, computing a scalar value with um, this inputs to the function, right? These are the input to the functions. And this will be scalar. Then you might ask like, why not just for instance, compute this, right? Like just dot product. Why not, right? I mean, if you're just if you just want to compute some scalar value between these two, then this can be a one way. But uh, probably this is not so good idea because in that case, then you have to map your hidden state very similar to decoder hidden state has to be very similar to encoder hidden state. So this is not super good idea, but the very similar idea can be used. In fact, another dominant idea was back then in twenty fifteen is have a weight between the S and HJ. So this was also very dominant. This is actually um, used by um, Luong et al. I'll put this on the uh, schedule too. I think this was 2015. But my point is that um, essentially how you compute the similarity, back then people thought different ways of computing the similarities or attention has a big difference, will make a big difference on the final performance of the model. But at the end, it turns out that this is not super important, how you define your similarity or attention mechanism. What's more important is that actually, we'll see actually is that uh, there are more subtle things that are more important, like for instance, how you tune it. But of course, back then we didn't know. We thought that um, this mechanism can be just absolutely better than the other methods or vice versa. And in, the, in this slide, I just wanted to show you that, okay, this is one way of computing the attention. And I also show you how you can compute the attention in another way. Maybe you wanna come up with your own. And that, may, that might be actually better for your specific task. I'm not saying there's any, there's no difference at all. It's more of that the difference is relatively small compared to what kind of data you use or how you train it, like what kind of optimizer you use, et cetera. So that's how you compute the relevance between um, the current time step and each hidden state in the input. And this was really, really exciting discovery because if you look at the history of machine translation, it was a um, really important problem since 1950s. And in fact, uh, back then, of course, the how people approach was very rule-based. And more recently, like starting in 2000s, people started to explore how you can formulate machine translation problem as a more of a statistical learning where you want to learn a probabilistic model from word-to-word -word transition in training data. And people call this SMT, 
statistical machine translation. And because machine translation is so important in the product, uh, well, and of course these days there are many products that's benefiting from NLP, but I think people have to uh, really, everyone will agree that MT was one of the most um, product related in NLP community. And that's why the SMT was really hot even when the AI, AI itself was not so hot for several years. And it was dominant until I would say 2014-ish or maybe 2015. But SMT was extremely complex. It's not neural net based. Uh, it's very feature engineering based, very complex. A lot of hand engineering, a lot of uh, um, efforts go into how you, can, how you design the model. But on the other hand, neural machine translation is extremely simple. And as you see, it's fully data driven. You just have to give out the, the input and output data. And you just have to have uh, thousands or millions of input output pairs to train your model. You just need good GPUs, a lot of data, and probably quite moder moderately good model to train a good MT system at the end. And it's actually surprising that an MT was first available 2014. And one year after that, 2015, people started to use attention mechanism to further improve NMT. And in 2015, with this improvement that we just saw, like using attention mechanism, it became very comparable to SMT in 2015. And after that, people started to, uh, a lot of uh, deep learning researchers started working on it. They basically start tried uh, larger models. They tried training with more data. And it was clear that in 2016, the NMT was outperforming SMT with a large margin. And that has really a lot of, uh, I would say, in retrospect, a lot of relationship with um, how the deep learning was invading NLP back then in 2015. Because I remember that uh, when I went to conferences um, in 2015, it was MNLP. I remember that was actually my first um, NLP conference. And I clearly remember that there were very few deep learning papers. It was very statistical, statistical methods driven. People were trying SVMs, um, you know, logistic regressions without any um, deep learning methods. Um, the paper I present back then was also very deep learning free, but by 2016, it was completely different. But you basically saw in every booth you go to, every paper was about deep learning because of this, that I think, I mean, probably this is not the only reason why the community was transitioning to deep learning, but I think the NMT and um, how the attention mechanism basically transformed the SMT, it was really shocking. I mean, they were, the SMT engineers were working on this like for years, like 10 years. And then the, these like deep, deep learning folks, they are just like, you know, students are very young. They just basically just spend only a few hours coding and then they just, you know, train these models on data. And then these models are much better than SMT and like people were shocked. Like, I'm okay, this really is actually something that's working. And I think um, that's where the really the transition took off, I think. Okay, by 2016, okay. Deep learning can be applied everywhere in NLP. It's no more, um, no more rule-based, no more, um, I would say, um, TFID at BM25. Although of course it's used a lot still these days, but I mean, more, more of a traditional NLP methods uh, were apparently no more as good as the new upcoming neural methods. I think so, um, people I think call it this way. Um, so deep learning was very, uh, had really dark era until 2012 when that the ImageNet challenge deep learning based method with CNNs beat every other methods. This was the really the era for the vision to take off. And then this went into NLP, I think in 2014 to 2015 ish, where the NMT took off. 
Um, so, wait. I think it's, uh, it's, I think it's quite interesting history if you think about it, like when you look back. So what's next then after that? I think people have different opinions, but I think really the um, the transformation was coming from Transformer from 2017. This basically says that, okay, you don't need um, anything like LSTM or attention, but you just need, you basically just need attention to do everything. And I think another wave of transformation came right after this year after, which is BERT which is changing the paradigm, not only changing the paradigm of model, transformer was a model or architecture, but in 2018, it was changing the paradigm of learning method that we're not, we should not just use vanilla training, but we actually have to utilize leverage pre-training. So our lectures now just got here. You can think of it as. And um, important notes though. So our assumption is that um, if this has, if this works well on the, um, for the machine translation, our assumption is that every vector corresponding to each input token is highly contextualized through the LSTMs. What that means is that because decoder, only decoder can look into encoder, the encoder vectors cannot look each other, right? They have only access to very nearby tokens by the definition of LSTM. So our assumption is that LSTM is powerful enough so that it can be highly contextualized on the encoder side. But this assumption may not be held if the input sequence is long, which was not super problematic in machine translation because machine translation, the problem was more of a sentence wise translation, at least data set wise. Of course, machine translation is also document wise problem. It can be a document wise problem if you're trying to translate entire document because the context is important, but at least the problem was not formulated that way back then, oftentimes. So, and you will see that actually the motivation of new architecture usually comes, comes from the limitations present in tasks. So in, in some sense, machine translation formulation back then was not perhaps um, super challenging enough to really think about the, uh, I would say, uh, why is it so important to do attention on the input side? But for other tasks, attention on the encoder side was more important when the, the input is very long. And this was especially a case for the, um, the machine reading comprehension task, which is also known as uh, more about question answering. I'll think I'll talk about what the terminology really means. It's kind of mixed up. I think right now it's kind of confusing for many people, but I'll use the term MRC or MR to refer to reading a certain context and get the answer from the text. And this had to deal with a lot of uh, long documents, for instance, squad. Um, and that's where the researchers on this, working on this problem had a, a lot of motivations on, okay, we're not trying to decode anything because MRC, as we have discussed, it's more of a token classification, but we need some attention on the encoder side too, because the documents are long. And it, even more in the MRC, you have two inputs, right? Not just one input. You have document and question. So how can you actually have some attention on between them? It's different from attention on the output, right? Decoding attention is on the outputs. I mean, from the output to the input, but can you do attention within the input? That was a motivation in machine reading comprehension in I would say 2016. And so now, we'll be moving to from the decoder attention to encoder attention in the next lecture. And mostly motivated by the MRC problem or token classification problem again. So we're kind of going back to token classification after covering briefly about text generation problem. And after we cover encoder attention, then probably you know enough to start your assignment too. And 
Um, after that, we'll be covering other things, uh, other details. One of the details that I want to also cover before moving out of the text generation is that the decoding is not actually super trivial. I mean, it's not a trivial problem because it's oftentimes more complicated than encoding. And it's complicated because training and inference are both tricky. And that's why there are several important tricks. For instance, uh, we use teacher forcing during training, which is actually, this is actually, um, for those of you who know what this means, this is actually biased training um, strategy because it doesn't exactly, exactly, uh, it's, it, if you train this way, then your um, training loss will not be unbiased towards your objective of creating the final sentence. But it turns out that actually there is no easy way of creating very um, low bias gradient or loss without increasing the variance for the text generation or se sequence to sequence. So we'll get back to this after going into the encoder attention from the MRC side so that you can start your assignment uh, early enough. And another important strategy is something similar to beam search, where during decoding, you want to explore a lot of, um, um, oh, actually, inference. During decoding, you want to explore a lot of possibilities so that you don't actually get stuck into local minima. But we'll come back to this after covering encoder attention so that you have you, you know everything you need for your next assignment soon. So I think it's good that um, in today's lecture, we had enough time to cover everything we need. So I'll end the lecture early today. Okay, so good luck with your assignment one and I'll see you next week.